So today's lecture is called Anthropological Perspectives. And basically what I want to do today is I want to give you a background of the field. Anthropology is essentially 180, 200 years old, somewhere in that range. Comes into its own, uh, although we have much deeper roots, but we really come into our own as part of the academy in the middle of the 19th century. And this is really the period when all of the social sciences kind of draw a circle around themselves and say this is what we are. Uh, our roots are in sociology. We uh, actually come out of sociology. In other parts of the world there is no difference between anthropology and sociology. In fact, if you were coming from India and you had a degree in sociology, you'd be fully qualified to teach anthropology in the United States because there isn't that much difference uh, in the foundation. The majority of the differences lie in um, methods. The theory, the practice, very, very similar. Methods are where we, we, um, where we diverge. Um, and so over the course of that, the last two centuries, um, anthropology has changed a lot. We uh, have changed who we consider our clients to be. We've, con we've changed how we view the world. We've changed the way in which we analyze the world. And so this first little lecture is, is to try to give you a foundational start, uh, introduce you to some of the key uh, theoreticians and some of the key theories, and then we will go from there. So the word anthropology comes from the Greek anthropos, meaning human, and of course logi or ology, Greek meaning science, theory, or it's the study of. So basically, uh, anthropology is the science or the study of uh, human, all things human, humanity. Um, and, and we're not really a science. We use science, but we are a social science, which means we're really part of the humanities. We are storytellers. Um, and so essentially, we, we are the study of humankind past, present, and anywhere and everywhere around the world. Anthropology is the study of people and their cultures. Its roots stretch back more than a thousand years to exotic travelers' tales imagining strange societies and peoples whose behavior fascinated early explorers. But scholars began this serious study of human culture only late in the 19th century. Early anthropologists studied customs and beliefs in pre-industrial societies in the hope of opening windows onto their own pasts in order to explain how institutions like religion or the family had come to be. Some of the texts that emerged during this period continue to be influential. Among them, Marcel Moss's book, The Gift, which argued that gifts, far from being free, create complex bonds of reciprocal obligation that help to underpin cultures. It was not until the early 20th century, though, that anthropology began to focus heavily on ethnography, the intensive long-term fieldwork that has become its best-known tool. Franz Boas in the United States and Bronislav Malinowski in Britain rejected much of their predecessors' work as speculation and insisted on living among the people they studied and talking to them in their own languages. The questions asked by anthropology got more ambitious, too. Rather than trying to understand how institutions developed over time, scholars began to ask how they fitted together to create a functioning society. This is the structural functionalist tradition, perhaps best exemplified by E. E. Evans Pritchard's Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic a book which demonstrated that belief in witchcraft made perfect sense when understood as a way of keeping order in society. Human culture is complex, and anthropology quickly developed into a number of specializations. Political anthropology questioned the assumptions of global politics, as when James Ferguson issued his challenge to the international development industry in The Anti-Politics Machine, and showed that aid is often directed to meet political goals rather than human needs. Medical anthropology explores differing experiences of medicine and disease. And Victor Turner, in The Ritual Process, explored the power of symbols through the performance of religious ceremonies. 
Feminist anthropology, too, has asked fundamental questions about the ways in which we understand society. Lila Abelugod wonders why Western academics see the clothes worn by Muslim women as symbols of subjugation rather than acceptance of a moral system, and why they expect Afghans to cast aside their burqas when they themselves would never wear a pair of shorts to an opera. The 1960s saw further advances in anthropological theory, beginning with Claude Livy Strauss's ambitious attempts to study cultures as structures of human thought. His book, Structural Anthropology, drew on a model derived from linguistics to introduce what became known as structuralism, the theory that cultures are built on hidden underpinnings formed from human perceptions and activity and the idea that all of these are constructs that are packed with meaning. A decade later, Clifford Gertz advanced another idea. His The Interpretation of Cultures suggested that culture should not be studied scientifically and in search of laws, but interpretively, by scholars in search of meaning. This fresh thinking forced a re-examination of much ethnographic fieldwork, but it also liberated anthropology from a focus on the reproduction of culture that had made it blind to social change. Johannes Fabian's Time and the Other provides an example of anthropologists radically rethinking the ways in which they approach the people whom they study. Fabian pointed out how easy it was to fall into the trap of writing about people as if they inhabited not just another place, but another time. His work helped to inspire the development of historical anthropology, and texts like Eric Wolf's Europe and the People Without History, which gave voice to people whose stories had formerly been ignored. Today, Anthropologists still seek new ways to reevaluate old problems and apply ethnographic methods to modern people in a rapidly changing and globalizing world. So anthropology includes four subfields. Now I'll use the word, the word field uh, on and off throughout the course of this uh, course. And sometimes when I use the word, the word field, I'm talking about the field of anthropology or the subfields and the sub-subfields underneath the field of anthropology. Other times when I use the word the field, I'm referring to uh, where we do our research. So the field can be both where we do our research and what we do, our, you know, the, the, the entire uh, field. Uh, anthropology in the United States has three, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, has four major subfields. Uh, British anthropology and most European anthropologies uh, only have um, three subfields, and I'll talk about the why and the wherefore in just a moment. So uh, in the United States, we have uh, cultural anthropology, which is what I do. Um, and what distinguishes cultural anthropology from all other uh, s studies, all other fields, is um, what we call ethnography. And ethnography is both what we do in the field, how we do our research, and what we publish, the published results. So we do ethnography and we publish an ethnography. Again, much of what we're going to cover in a lot of these lectures is just the terminology because we, like in any, uh, any field, there's a lot, there are a lot of terms and coming to grips with those terms will help you then understand what it is we're talking about. So cultural anthropology is uh, the first one I want to talk about and the one that, that I practice on a regular basis. Uh, the next one is, is uh, biological or physical anthropology. We've called it both over the years. Essentially, that is the study of, of human evolution in primates. Uh, primatology falls under that as well as uh, human evolution and uh, things like osteology, understanding bones, being able to, to determine diseases from uh, bones and things like that. So it's a, uh, it is a much more scientific form of anthropology, but it, it is still not science. Um, it uses a lot of science, but um, uh, it, it itself doesn't set up experiments and then, then test them. Um, linguistic anthropology is a, is a cousin to uh, cultural anthropology, and it uses language and the migration of language and the changes of language and the geography of language uh, to try to study human culture. And then 
finally, and those three all exist in, in British and European anthropology, um, I, the biggest difference being archaeology, and I'll explain that in a minute. Ar archaeology is what most people think of when they uh, think of anthropologists, somebody digging in the dirt for dinosaurs. Well, number one, dinosaurs are not archaeology. They are paleontology. Uh, archaeology, although archaeologists have been known to dig up a tusk from time to time, uh, archaeologists are basically trying to dig up human culture, not biological remains or, or evidence of biological remains from the past. And so um, there's, there's a, some of the methods are the same, some of the techniques are the same, but the theory and the, the background are all completely different. Now, in the United States, archaeology is under anthropology primarily because of America's unique racist past. Um, America is uh, born in genocide and built on the backs of slaves, and we tend to um, perpetuate a lot of what has come before uh, I in the present. And so archaeology is actually a reflection of that. Uh, and let me, let, let me go to Europe, and then I'll use Brit Britain as an example, or, or England as an example, uh, primarily because I also teach uh, history of the British Isles, and so it's a quick, easy reference for me. Um, so if you were to go to, if, let's say that you were a college student in uh, the UK, not here in the US, and you wanted to study archaeology, you wouldn't go to the anthropology department, you would go to the history department, because it is in the history department where archaeology sits. Because if you walk out to, to, your, to your backyard, or to your garden, as they would call it, to your back garden, and you stick a shovel in the ground, and you dig down six inches, and then put the shovel aside and start scraping with a trowel, you will hit Victorian. And before that, you will hit Tudor and Georgian, and you will hit Anglo-Saxon, and you will hit Roman, and you will hit Iron Age, and you will hit Bronze Age, and you will hit Neolithic, and you will hit uh, uh, Mesolithic, and you might even hit Paleolithic, because for a hundred thousand years, humans have occupied the British Isles, and there is a connection between the past and the present. Now, humans have existed in, in North America almost as long as they have existed elsewhere. However, because the academy comes with the introduction of, of people from Europe, um, and they're the ones telling the stories, there's a, rather than, when, when you scrape in the United States, you don't find uh, our past, quote, America's past. What you find is the indigenous past, and that's the other. They are racially separate, they're culturally separate, they're separated in time, and so it grew up under anthropology, which came out of ethnohistory, which was the study of Native Americans, uh, just as cultural anthropologists in Europe and in England were helping the colonizers control uh, the colonies that, that those countries had. Uh, in this country, the ethnohistorians and later the anthropologists worked with the government to try to subdue and subjugate the Native Americans. And so that the our connection, our attachment to um, the uh, 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 to the past. It, it's severed with the arrival of white people. Anything before that is the other, and so archaeology here is the study of the foreign, the other, the exotic. Whereas archaeology in, in much of the rest of the world is grandpa and grandma and great-great-grandma, and um, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a tie. I mean, we'll talk about this later, but the uh, the th there's a skeleton was found in a cave in the Cheddar Gorge in, in the UK. Uh, 8,000 years ago. Uh, his descendants, they have done this by testing the DNA, his, his descendants still live in the Cheddar, uh, in the Cheddar Gorge, in the, in the Cheddar region. And so there is no differentiation between what came before and what exists today. So in England, it is called social anthropology as opposed to cultural anthropology. Um, in, the, in Britain, they focus primarily on social structures and institutions, the family, education, um, you know, what, the, the religious institutions, all of the institutions and the social structures that, um, that govern society. 
American cultural anthropology is, is a little different. Instead of looking so much at the structures and institutions, we look at practices, we look at, at expression and language, we looked at, at shared we look at shared meaning uh, we look at shared meaning making. Uh, we also look at structures and institutions, but we but they're not our primary uh, emph emphasis. Um, I tend to call myself a sociocultural anthropologist because I kind of blend uh, uh, the two, and I'm also a, a, a historian, but I'm not a historical anthropologist, although maybe one of these days I'll decide that that's what I am. Uh, I have, may have to change the way I do some of the things, but um, uh, many anthropologists are, are interdisciplinary simply by the nature of the beast. One of the things that differentiates anthropology from sociology and every one of the other ologies is uh, what we refer to as the ethnographic method. Uh, we describe it as participant or participatory observation. In other words, we primarily focus our research on intensive field work, long stays over extended periods of time. We go to the field, we observe the field. We don't worry so much about statistics we don't do we do surveys but that's not our primary uh, function we aren't looking at numeric data we are looking at qualitative data what can you observe what does it what are they doing how are they dressed how are they doing it and then try to figure out what it means um, it, it, it that's this is what differentiates uh, differentiates us from all the other uh, social sciences. Sociologists will tell you that they do ethnography and, and, uh, and anthropologists will tell you that they do surveys. Uh, we don't do surveys well and they don't do ethnography well. Um, although um, uh, over at Fresno State the chair at, at one point is, uh, was considered herself an ethnographic sociologist. So I mean there is overlap in the, in the disciplines but um, that's just the nature of the beast. So uh, when we go out into the field, there, there are a number of things that we have to take into consideration. Number one, we have to be able to, 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 to speak the language. Um, there's, there's no point in going into the field if you can't communicate with the people that you're observing. Um, very often it is necessary for the observer either once they're in the field or before they go to the field to learn customs, behaviors, norms, cultural rules, uh, understand, you know, taboo, understand uh, uh, proper expression, courtesies, those types of things. Uh, and the purpose of, of doing this, the purpose of going into the field and, 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 and really trying to uh, boil down the society based on what you observe or the culture on what you observe, uh, we, we do that through a number of different methods and techniques and we will talk about these in detail as the course goes on but we do it through observation and we do it through participation we we actually we don't just observe we're not stalkers we don't just sit around the edges we actually get involved with the community we get to know the members we get to 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 know them in a way that we begin to ascertain their motivations and their their thoughts and their emotions and the things behind them. We also do interviews. Uh, the interviews are, are tend to be whole life interviews or oral history interviews, life histories. Um, we also concrete uh, collect concrete data. This is this is more of a quantitative, uh, and so we will do surveys. We'll figure out the number of people in a community. We'll figure out the relations. We'll do all kinds of, of things. We'll figure out how the families are related, that type of thing. One of the ways that we do this is by, in the field, we take field notes. Now, everyone, just like y you taking notes in a class, uh, each one of you does it a different way. Uh, and this is true of, of people in the field. There are lots of different techniques for taking field notes. Each of us does it differently. Um, uh, we will talk about that as, as we go on. Uh, but it's, uh, it's basically us recording in as much detail as necessary to capture what we see. And that can be augmented, in the field notes can be augmented by video, they can be augmented by audio, they can be aug augmented by photographs, but don't rely on those things because none of those capture the feeling uh, that you had when you were actually in that situation. So many of us supplement our field notes with electronic data collection, but um, we all we, we understand or hopefully we understand that 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 is only a snapshot literally of of that moment um, and then there's a, a one final part and that uh, this is one of the more fun parts 
uh, and it also is one of the most crucial parts. And that is for the ethnographer, the anthropologist, to actually um, chronicle his or her own actions. What was it like to be in the field? What was it that, that you were surprised about? What shocked you? What was new? What, what didn't you expect? What did you expect? What did you feel? What, did, what do you think your subjects felt? Um, what were the difficulties you had? What were the things that were easy? And then by, understand, by, by documenting those things and attaching them to your observation of the community, it actually gives the context or a portion of the context um, that the reader or the, the listener will have then uh, in looking at the ethnography, they understand the process that, that uh, went behind actually producing that ethnography. As I said before, um, the field is a term we use two different ways. Um, and this point I want to do it, not the field of anthropology, but the field where we do our research. As I said before, especially in the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, um, anthropologists tended to seek out the other. And again, consider when a lot of this is going on, the 1860s through the 1920s. Uh, this is a, a, a period of uh, colonial colonization. Uh, essentially, the Global South is owned and controlled by the Global North, whether it's the, the Brits or the Germans or the, the French or the Americans. We, we either are, are in the process at that particular point of imperialism or colonialism. And so very often the anthropologist went to study the other, someone distant, someone alien, someone in a completely different place. And we've done a lot of that. And the world is changing, and the world is, is uh, uh, modernizing rapidly, and uh, places that were uh, completely foreign and alien 50 years ago probably look a lot like your own backyard now. And so uh, the, the need to seek out the exotic, uh, one, is becoming less important, and two, we're starting to realize that, that that's almost, a f almost fetishism. That really isn't... Uh, we need to go beyond looking at the other and, and maybe look at the self. Um, the, um, I think that's where, where we end up today. And so, uh, especially in the area of applied anthropology, we have found um, many many new social and cultural worlds. And the reason I keep using social and cultural uh, in, in separate and unique ways is they really are different. We'll talk about those definitions uh, at, in, in, in the future. But to, so today we look at, at not tribal units in Africa or at, at American reservations or villages in Central America, but we look at, um, at the culture of, of, uh, of a lab. Um, uh, how scientists working together, or uh, you know, the um, uh, uh, businesses working together, uh, computer programmers. How do they interact in their in their particular shop, or are they do they even act together? If they are, how, what about telecommuting? Um, global migration. We look at that a lot because we no longer live in isolated pockets. We are completely intertwined between our uh, production chains and our migration chains. Uh, we are connected to every part of, of, the, 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 uh, uh, of the planet. We look at, at popular culture and media. Um, uh, it, it, it's one of the more interesting aspects of what we do. A few years ago, my son was uh, uh, presenting a paper at an anthropological association uh, here in California, and at that particular time, so this was maybe five years ago, so we'd say right around uh, 2015 or so. Uh, at that particular point, he was giving a paper on uh, an ethnography that he had done on a community wrapped around Creepypasta, which is an online storytelling uh, community. And it's a community made up of uh, authors and performers and artists and all kinds of people that are involved in, in writing and producing and augmenting and experiencing these little short stories, little short horror stories that they've been circulating and rewriting and writing new ones and modifying and doing animations of and all kinds of stuff all over the world for many, many, even before, prior to the internet. It goes all the way back to the bulletin board world. And 
at the time that he gave that paper, out of a hundred papers at that conference, there were we we couldn't put together a single panel on uh, internet communities. Uh, he was on uh, basically uh, on a panel on communication. By the next year, we had several panels of internet communities and, and alternate communities, including furries and things like that. And today, we probably have uh, five or six panels at every conference out of those 100 papers that, were, that are presented every year. Uh, probably five or six panels of three to six people uh, all talking about various and sundry internet communities, whether it's dating communities or whether it's communities around uh, anything. A, a community can be defined in many, 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 many ways, and so uh, all think of all the different communities that you're a part of on uh, that you're a part of on the web. You know, you might have it be on Facebook, and even in Facebook, you might be in several different groups, or you might be in the news, your your Instagram one, and your family has. I mean, you you are divided in, in and a member of a million different communities when you actually start thinking about it. Some of the other stuff that we look at is we look to, we take a look at at government policies, the nation state. We look at at globalization. We look at at localization. We look at a lot of of, uh, of not necessarily in the same way that political scientists do, but in ways that we look at at how government and the governed uh, interact as part of culture. And the other thing I want to talk about the field before I go on is is this concept of multi-sided field work. Um, in the past, basically, an anthropologist went to the field, studied a group, was there for a long time, left, wrote it up, done. Uh, we still do that type of, of, of field work, an extended stay in a, in, in a single society or single culture. We also do what we refer to as multi-sided field work. For example, the work that I do, which focuses on uh, a number of historically rural African-American settlements throughout the San Joaquin Valley. There are, uh, between uh, labor camps, unincorporated uh, uh, towns, unincorporated neighborhoods, and towns that were started as black colonies, uh, there's a, we're getting close to a, a, almost a three dozen now. Uh, and so my, my research isn't in just one community. It's spread out across all of these. Um, there's, they're related. They're also, each one is, is separate. So uh, you could say that the San Joaquin Valley is a single site, so it could be a single site there. Uh, or you could say that each one of the communities that I work in is a separate site, and so it would be a multi-sited fieldwork project. I want to talk about some of the key uh, theoreticians, the early ones especially, uh, a couple of them, uh, Franz Boas we'll talk about, we'll talk about Krober. Um, but we want to talk about the, the changing concepts of theory uh, throughout the uh, the history of anthropology and and how we got from where we are to from where we were to where we are. So Franz Boas was the head of the Department of Anthropology at Columbia f at the turn, of the, cen uh, the turn of the 20th century. And well into the first third of the 20th century, he, he really kind of defined American anthropologic, uh, anthropological research and the methods and the ways that we approach. And a lot of what we use today uh, goes straight back to uh, Franz Boas. Um, and there are a couple of, of, of principles that we want to talk about. One of which, he says, is that anthropology has to be historical. It has to be historical by its very nature because um, if you're going to study humans, each community got to where they are through their own history. And that hi their history is unique. And that each community whether we're talking about an, an environment in a doctor's office, or whether we're talking about a village, or whether we're talking about a nation, each community has a unique historical particularity, which, we'll, again, we'll talk about more in the future. And so he pushed us, uh, especially in, in 1932, he wrote a book called Aims of Anthropological Research. And in it, he lays out the, um, the, the justification for... Um, uh, for American anthropologists, th that our purpose is to study the universality and the variety of cultures. In other words, the things that are the same and the things that are different. And that by understanding cultures past and present, 
will help shape the future. And I think you'll see over the course of, of, the, of, this, of this class that uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things that um, uh, are very forward-thinking, that, that could have a major impact on uh, the future of the world. So we'll be discussing that in, in great detail. One of the things that we look to Franz Boas for is, um, is race. Um, he is probably the first to take on um, the Western concept of race. Um, we'll have entire lectures on, on race and, uh, throughout the course of this class, but um, essentially um, he comes into his own at the same time that in this country is a pseudoscience called eugenics. This is actually what the Nazis will use to justify uh, the genocide. It's an American invention. Uh, they, they loved the, the Americans for that reason, or loved the Americans for that reason. Um, the in fact, the Germans were critical of Jim Crow that we didn't go far enough, that we only segregated, we didn't execute. And, and so... Um, it is Franz Boas in the 20s and 30s who comes out and, and, and attacks this pseudoscience of eugenics by actually applying real science to it. Whereas eugenics had looked at a few skulls, a few bones, and measured things out and proved, according to their technologies, that, that white people were superior, black people were at the bottom, and people of, of brown, red, and yellow uh, were somewhere in the middle. Um, and by brown at that point, they meant uh, people from, Southeast, or sub, from South Asia, not from... Uh, uh, not Hispanic. Uh, in this country, we think brown, we think Hispanic, which doesn't make sense because there are blonde, blue-eyed Hispanics and there are people of African descent who are Hispanics, but we'll talk about that um, as we go on. Um, and Boaz is able to demonstrate uh, through just raw numbers that there is less uh, distinction between races than there is among individuals of a given race. And so you can actually see more variety uh, within a group that's classified as a single race than you can by trying to compare the differences between one race uh, and another. And so uh, essentially the primary focus of uh, our understanding of race in the, in, in the anthropological world is that there is one race. There is the human race. And that kind of underscores a lot of, of, of our thinking. I often ask my students, what race is this family? This is a single family. What race are they? There are very light-colored people, light-colored skin people in here. There are uh, people of very, very dark-colored skin. Uh, this is a single family. Uh, what race is this family? Or are they members of separate races or different races? That's all determined by culture. So, essentially, we don't believe that there's any relationship between a racial type and the culture. Different cultures are at different stages or different uh, levels of complexity, but that has nothing to do whatsoever with the quote-unquote race of the members of that particular community. Uh, it's much more cultural or, or even ethnic, if you want to call it that, uh, that has a, a lot more to influence on uh, the differences, differences between different cultures. Cultural phenomenon is not produced by race. It is produced by the interaction of individuals and society. That's what makes culture. Um, you cannot reduce culture to geography, to the environment, to economics, and especially not to race. So, um, I want you to kind of think about this. If we, if we were in a face-to-face -face class right now, we would be discussing this. But uh, just kind of as we go through a bunch of the rest of this, think about what, what is it that exists that we can use to study the, cultural, uh, the culture of past human societies? What are some of the things that we can look at? And I'm just, I'm not going to go through it here, but we, we, I want you to think about it. And that what doesn't always appear in the historical or the archaeological record? I would assume your first answer would have been hist you know, the historical record and archaeology. Uh, but there's a lot that doesn't appear in either of those. Um, and um, 
part of the, the job of, of anthropology, uh, especially historical anthropology, is to kind of reconstruct that cultural history. Often, when we look at different cultures, we, we kind of focus on, well, where did they come from? And we sometimes make assumptions. Um, oftentimes, the origin of something has absolutely nothing to do with where or how it's practiced contemporary, in the contemporary world. Um, for, for example, you know, we talk about Western religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Uh, they all come from the Middle East. They all come from either Palestine or Arabia. Um, those are not Western religions. They are Westernized, but the Judaism and Christianity are probably strongest in the West, but neither is a Western religion. And so there's no connection between the origins of those religions and the areas in which they are most uh, uh, prominent today. Buddhism would be another example. It starts in India, moves to China, and then eventually to Japan. It is a minority. It's the eighth largest religion in India today. Um, uh, other religions are, are larger than uh, Buddhism in India, where it originated. And the same is true of, of, of uh, some of the so-called Western religions as well. One of the jobs that we try to do when we're in the field is we try to understand similarities between uh, cultures. And sometimes we will find that similar conditions create similar outcomes. And so we see similar cultural forms, we see uh, parallel invention or, or, or co-invention. Um, and we're never sure whether these are parallel or whether, whether they are done by diffusion or whether they are truly parallel, whether you, they're unique. We have, sometimes we have to figure that out. Uh, very often, uh, we find by trying to trace some of those similarities between cultures that they truly are links. Linguistics is an area that we look at this a lot because as language migrates, so do concepts that are attached to that language. If you have to have the language in order to describe a concept. If you don't have it, the concept can't exist. And so um, the looking at similarities between cultures often will, will, will provide links and other uh, uh, in-depth understanding of, of, the, of the cultures. Um, we still have to focus on the interdependence of cultural phenomena. Um, that's by looking at, at um, individuals' traits as well as the overall culture. Uh, we have to look at things like inventions and social structure and art, religion, all of these. And these become even more interesting when you're talking about a multicultural society like much of Western Europe and the United States today where we are not a monoculture. We are, you know, multiple religions, multiple ethnic groups, multiple races, multiple genders, multiple this, that, and the other thing. And yet we still have to have some form of cultural cohesion that link that keeps us together as a as a as a nation we lose that cultural cohesion which we often are at risk of doing uh, and then we lose the possibility of remaining a solid culture a solid uh, even a, a, as a nation uh, we we are weaker as we lose that cultural um, uh, cohesion at the same time, we become stronger by bringing in all of the different points of view and, and, and backgrounds, and, and um, we become more culturally rich. So there's a, a line between maintaining the purity of a culture and then the incorporation of those things that are good in other cultures. So there's an in, in, interesting dynamic that plays out almost daily around the planet. So we view society as a complex whole. We look at politics, economics, religion, language, gender, uh, race, etc. All of the different 
ways that you can describe society, we try to look at it through all of those things. And so there are political anthropologists, there are economic anthropologists, there are anthropologists who study religion. In fact, uh, almost every campus has an anthropology of religion class. Most people take that class thinking they're going to learn about Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism and discover that what they're really learning about is how does religion work and what is its purpose and, and what are the different forms of religion, not necessarily the specific individual religions. And so we use these, these uh, uh, things that separate into other disciplines, we try to incorporate them as much as possible for as, as holistic a view as possible of the world here in anthropology. We try to focus on the dynamics of societies by looking at the, the different aspects of and cultural forms. Uh, in other words, where do what role does art, does literature, does religion, does gender, do all of these things, what role do they play? What role does the environment play? What role does climate play? What role does, does geography play? Um, and we're constantly looking at that intersection of the individual and society. Much of, of, of the way we approach things, you'll see parallels in, in things like psychology, where you're dealing with an individual, maybe dealing with society, but basically uh, the individual is the focus. Whereas here the focus is the society and the individual within it. And we'll talk a lot about individuals and agency and, and how that plays into the overall um, score. As I said earlier, I uh, sometimes will we'll use the term society and sometimes I will use the term culture. The majority of the time I will rely on E.B. Taylor's uh, uh, definition um, that splits those two in two completely separate uh, realms. So a culture or a civilization is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. So a society is necessary in order to have a culture. The society is just the collection of beings. You can have, you know, bees are a social animal. They have a society. Wolves are a social animal. They have a society. Any grouping of any beings um, where they rely on one another in, in their their day-to-day -day, uh, living is a society. What makes it a culture is, again, those things that make humans human, the things that make us unique. It is literature and poetry and art and uh, food and um, uh, clothes and style and entertainment and yada 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 all the things that we think are beautiful all the things we think are important those are the things that's culture that's those are the things that we acquire that, that we take on and say this is is who we are as a people di differentiating between the identity of the individual and the identity of uh, the culture One of the guys that we rely on is, is Alfred Kroeber. We go back to the mid 19th century, or the, the mid 20th century, actually. Um, and he expands on that definition of culture to say that, a cult that culture has to be learned. Right? You don't have to learn anything to be a member of a society, but you do have to learn in order to become a member of a culture. And that learning is acquired. In fact, we'll talk throughout the course of the, of the semester, we will talk about how you acquire culture. The culture is always acquired um, first on your mother's knee, and then within your, um, your family, and then within your, uh, the next group out, which could be your church group, it could be school, it could be uh, the media, it could be the society at large, it could be, you know, it, it just, whatever circles, but it expands out. But everything we are, everything that you think you are that is natural to you, is learned. You acquired it from your family. If you take two twins, split them up, put them in two completely different cultures, they will each be perfect reflections of the culture in which they were raised, and they will share very little. And so understand that culture, unlike a society, is acquired. It's also shared, right? I can't have a culture by myself. I'm, there's art I like, there's art I create, but I'm not creating a culture because it's not the interaction with me and society or with it and society or uh, whatever. So it has to be shared. It has to be shareable. There have to be more than two of us in a culture or two or more of us in a culture. 
and culture has to be transmitted, whether it is from the process we call habitus, starting on your mother's knee and working out, or whether it is through uh, the educational system, through the academy, through the media, uh, but culture, all of those things are shared and they're passed on and they're passed on generation to generation. Each culture may throw away, each generation may throw away culture from their the, the prior generations. They'll keep what's important and discard what they feel isn't important. Um, and that, that is normal and it's common. Now, remember culture is super organic. It is not biological. There, there have been attempts in the past to say humanity is like an organism and it functions just like an organism. And there are certain similarities as far as, as uh, biological patterns of, of uh, uh, reproduction and things like that. But, but the really, you can't really call uh, society biological in, it, in, in any way, shape, or form. I mean, obviously, it isn't biological and except for the fact that it's made up of biological units. But the society itself doesn't function like uh, an animal or a vegetable or, or anything along that where it would be biological. It's also um, super individual. It is shared beyond one person, right? Uh, society uh, is two people just sharing space. Culture is um, two or more people sharing all of those other accoutrements, which we will call culture. Um, Krober goes on to say that culture has to be integrated, that it is uh, a, a collection of parts that fit into the whole, Ideation, ideational, in other words, it, there are ideals and ideas behind it, there's meaning behind action, that, that there is symbolic thought, right? Much of what we, you know, C-A-T is not a cat, right? A picture of a cat's a cat, but C-A-T isn't cat. That is, is symbolic thought. You look at those letters, that puts together a word, you can then create the image of the cat based on the, 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 the combination of the characters, the symbols, and so you put all that together and you're coming up with a new idea, and that's part of what we're talking about when we're talking about by being ideational. Uh, culture is also adaptive. It changes. It changes Regular. I just saw a video of uh, the um, uh, performer that won the country album of the year in, tw I think it was 2019, uh, and it was a black dude in a, a, a gold lame jumpsuit, um, it, which is just completely incongruous from my understanding of country music. Um, and so culture changes and adapts over time. I'm, I'm in my 60s. Uh, I, I think of country music being Buck Owens, Merle Haggard, and stuff like that there. Uh, I don't think of a black dude in a gold lame jumpsuit. So it's just, it, it's a very, uh, um, you know, culture is not static. It can and it will always change and evolve. Um, and very often in culture, as we, we look at culture, one of the things that we look at is the, the uh, relations of power. Now, we often don't think of this, but you can break down the entire world into ideas of who has power and who doesn't have power. And so we, um, we look at the different structures of, of conflict, of hierarchy, right? Now, social status, social, social stratification. We look at inequality, the, the, the gaps of, of the haves and the have-nots, how that affects the culture. All of, we look at all of those things. So now let's take a quick look at some of the, the major ideas that have shaped anthropology over the years. In the middle of the 19th century, um, we looked a lot to the natural sciences, especially evolution. And really there were two, in the middle of the 19th century, there were two um, theories, two scientific theories that had really captured um, the popular mind. Uh, one was evolution, the other was Freudian psychology. And so you'll see that a lot of that filters its way into um, much of the social sciences. And um, it, causes some interesting approaches and some interesting views of, of what society is and how it works. One of the first of those is um, unilineal cultural evolution. Again, it comes right out of this idea of, of evolution, and it's a very 19th century concept. And although we don't apply the concept as a whole, as a total, 
we still kind of keep the category, the, the classifications, because they, they work. And this is, you'll find a lot of the early theories in anthropology, we've kept bits and pieces of them and thrown the rest of it out. Uh, we retain these theories, but we don't apply them as a universal theory. In the 19th century, it was believed that you could come up with each of the social sciences with a single universal theory that could explain the entire uh, discipline. Um, and that was attempted repeatedly in anthropology, and we'll go through some of those uh, throughout this lecture and others. But um, ultimately, what we, what we end up doing is we end up keeping the best of each of those and discarding the rest of it. And so unilineal uh, cultural evolution looks at the different stages that a culture goes through in its development. The idea being that it starts at the primitive, which is hunting and gathering, and then it works its way to civilization, which is the nation state. And it goes through various stages of, of hunting and gathering, horticulture, agriculture, ci uh, uh, villages, city-states, nation-states. Um, each of those exist. Each of those is a, a type of society that we look at. Um, very often, societies have made their way through some of those stages in those sequences. Um, the, uh, if, if you had to take a class, a lower division class called Western Civ at some time in, in your life, uh, you'll, you'll see that those are covered and those are laid out as kind of the progress of, of civilization, the progress of becoming civilized. Uh, but what they fail to leave out in that discussion is that they don't just take a single spot and go through the civilization of that spot. It doesn't go from hunting and gathering to the nation state in one spot. Uh, that it actually, you know, this starts over here, and then over here this comes, and over here this happens, and da da da, and it's all over the place. And so we finally realized that these are, are useful categories, but the idea that every society has to go from one to the other. Um, doesn't pan out. In fact, it really gets uh, blown apart when you start uh, thinking of people moving from one area to another or or from rapid change. For example, but this happened in some places in Africa and in China where they've gone from village, primitive, you know, quote unquote primitive village life to uh, 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 21st century urban life in the matter of, of, a, of a couple of years. Um, skipping all of the interim uh, uh, societies that they should have had to have gone through, or the cultures they would have had to have gone through. Um, the One of the problems with this is that it, it essentially, again, plays into racism. Uh, where do nation states begin? They begin in Western Europe. Therefore, if that's the culmination, if that's the epitome of civilization, forget uh, you know, the fact that China for 4,000 years has been far more civilized than anybody in the West. Um, the uh, it, it 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 again this notion of primitive and civilization we 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 originally had we've thrown it away it's too ethnocentric it is uh, uh, it just assumes that everyone is the same and that's not true uh, and it also equates being civilized with material culture with as as we have factories and airplanes and all of this stuff that must be civilization saying that a uh, hunter gatherer who's wearing clothes that are completely appropriate for the environment in which they live in and e eating, uh, working far fewer hours every day to get their, uh, uh, their nutrition and their, their uh, place to sleep every night uh, than you do, um, we don't call them civilized. And yet they are civilized. They just, their civilization is a different type of civilization than an urban, modern, industrialized civilization. So. Um, again, another concept that we just threw out. Franz Boas not only gives us um, a foundation to look at diversity, human diversity. Um, I've already talked to you a little bit about the what we call historical particularism, which I'll talk about more again in a bit. The number one thing, and this this is um, one of the most crucial concepts that I want you to understand because as you go through this course you're going to be learning about things that are very different from what you think the world is and as a result you're gonna read something and go this is weird these people are weird these people are strange these people what what the, in other words just in other in it rather than just realizing that they're different we put a value judgment on it and 
where this where this where 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 combating this comes from is from Franz Boas and this concept of cultural relativism. In other words, we examine a culture relative to its own standards, not ours. When we judge a society or a culture, we're not using our standards, our moral, legal, religious values, whatever they happen to be. We use their own, that society's own view of themselves. That, that the differences in people are a result of our unique histories, our unique geographic conditions, our unique um, diet and climate. All of these things play into what makes societies different and you must take into consideration the environment in which that culture evolves and not put a value on the judgments that you make when you're when you're when you're when you're examining it and that regardless of what you think a society should or shouldn't have a culture should or shouldn't have that all communities all populations have an equally developed culture. It just may be that they're fully functional and fully sufficient in a mode of uh, an economic mode that may be different than yours. And hunting and gathering still exists on the planet. Why does it still exist? Because for the majority of human existence, that's how we got our sustenance. It is successful. It works. It is the is probably the most efficient way to feed smaller numbers of people because you use far less resources and you um, uh, they're, 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 you don't have to have a stratified society. It, it's just much, much easier. People work an average of three hours a day in hunting and gathering societies to get all of their nutrition and their, their, their shelter. You have to work an average of eight hours a day to do the same and you may not be able to afford either. So, um, you know, again, we have to take each society as it comes relative to itself, cultural relativism, and I will keep saying that. When you do, uh, when you look at one of the, the online readings that I want you to read for this class, and you come back and you go, these people are weird, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump all over you. Nobody's weird. We're all unique. We're all different. Your job isn't to tell me that they're weird. Your job isn't to judge them. Your job is to learn to understand them. That's what this class is all about. As I mentioned earlier, the other main concept we get from Franz Boas is what we refer to as historical particularism. And this is, again, and I've said it once and I'll say it again, and I will probably repeat it a dozen times as we go through. Every society has a unique history, and we must assume that their present is based on their specific history. That, that uni there, are, there is no universal law as to how a, a society or a culture should function, that each society, each culture functions in the way that it does based on its own history, its geography, its population, and how it got to that point. And so we often um, We'll look at a society and go, oh, you know, th this is all messed up, da, 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 instead of trying to look at how they got there. And this, so when I use the term historical particularism, I'm saying you have to understand that society's or that culture's particular history in order to understand their particular present. Franz Boas's Race, Language, and Culture. How should we compare different cultures? Franz Boas, an American anthropologist and advocate for human rights, lived from 1858 to 1942, a time when hierarchical cultural theories were widespread. He disagreed with this school of thought, and in Race, Language, and Culture, a collection of essays released in 1940, he presented a different view. Boas argued that humans are not reducible to simple understandings based upon their biology. Instead, we are shaped by several other factors. The cultures people interact with and major historical events in their ancestors' lives help determine a societal structure. Culture, Boas believed, is a bigger determinant of evolution in human societies than biology. Further, Boas believed we couldn't make value judgments of the traditions and beliefs of societies that developed in completely different environments. 
In doing so, he developed cultural relativism, which states that we can't judge different cultures using our own cultural values. Similarly, Boaz rejected hierarchical theories that ranked cultures in terms of their value or worth. He contended that societies may be different, but none are better than any other. To understand Boaz's argument, let's consider a pair of societies on an island. One society exists up in the mountains, while the other is located by the coast. The coastal society's culture is based on fishing. Inhabitants learn to fish at a young age, and the whole population survives off the ocean. The mountain society's culture is based on hunting. Inhabitants begin hunting while they are children, and the population's main food is meat. Both societies have developed a stable social structure based on their primary activity. Their political, economic, and religious lives are built around this. These two societies are not in contact, except for a few travelers who have passed from one place to the other. From the stories they share, each society decides their way of living is superior to the other. One day, the leaders of the two societies meet and begin to talk. Each highlights the benefits of their way of life, believing that they can improve the other society. As time passes, they both begin to realize that neither society is better or worse, but they are just different. They recognize that to understand each other's way of life at all, they would have to use cultural relativism. This requires them to understand the complex factors that have shaped the other society. Franz Boas's Race, Language and Culture was a highly progressive work which became very influential to 20th century American anthropology. Two important early 20th century uh, British anthropologists are Radcliffe Brown and Malinowski, and we, again we will touch back to both of these at different times. Uh, they came up with the concept they refer to as structural functionalism, in other words, structures that have functions. And they saw society, or culture in this case, as a living organism. They saw it as more biological, and I've already said that it isn't, but again, this is how we get there. Um, and so what they did is they focused on social structures, institutions, marriage, the family, schools, um, uh, churches, religions, whatever you want, you know, the different institutions, and looked to see how they functioned to fulfill basic human needs. And the idea was, was that a society, every society would find its best ways, based on its geography and its particular history, uh, historical situation, uh, they would find the the right way to to um, uh, to function to to structure their society so that everyone's needs would the most people's needs would be met. Um, problem with that is that it then makes the assumption that if everyone's needs are being met, that um, that society exists in a state of equilibrium. As long as everyone's needs are being met, there needs to be no change. Um, and yet change happens all the time, even when everyone's needs are being met. Um, you know, that's what's the whole purpose behind propaganda or advertising is to convince you that you have needs that you didn't even know you had. And so the problem with structural functionalism is that it pretty much requires an unchanging society, that um, it doesn't allow for individuals um, it doesn't allow for individual agency, and it doesn't really in, in, uh, allow for uh, organic, I hate to use that word, but organic change, change that comes from, uh, from within. Switch over to, to the French school, um, and we get Claude Levi-Strauss. Not Levi Strauss, that's the guy that made your blue jeans. We're talking here about a, a, guy, a French dude named Levi-Strauss. Um, and he really works primarily in the 70s in, in that particular range. And he looks at uh, language, or he looks at, at culture the way that linguists look at language. In other words, looking at the structure of the culture is kind of like looking at grammar. And so 
how is structure so, how is society structured in such a way uh, like nouns and verbs and adjectives in, in other words how the structures are combined has a lot to do with with culture again uh, the problem is is that it is that it, these things get locked they get frozen and it unlike functionalism structural functionalism um, which doesn't allow for change one of the problems with structuralism as such is that it makes the assumption that structures are universal that the family is a universal structure which is probably one of the very very few but all of the other things that we look at as as part of of, of society um, are historical in nature and you need to analyze them that way and so by just saying here's the here are the structures, these are the things that influence the society. Um, it, it, it is insufficient. Again, we rely on structuralism, we just don't use it as a grand theory that explains everything. Claude Levi Strauss's Structural Anthropology Do diverse cultures share more similarities than differences? French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss believed that they do. In his book, Structural Anthropology, he argued that parallels across cultures are more important than the differences between them. Strauss believed that humans have many basic needs in common. For example, the need to reconcile our understandings of birth and death. Cultural institutions arise to serve these mental needs, and hence Strauss argued that people are governed by the structure of their own minds. This theory has come to be called structuralism. Structuralism looks at particular manifestations of culture as largely incidental. It's more interested in uncovering the regularities that underlie the world's cultures rather than exploring how they are different. Strauss was concerned with common mental needs, which are interpreted in different ways by different cultures. He believed that the most important human need is the reconciliation of common binary opposites. These include life and death, love and hate, and allies and enemies. Strauss believed that we can best investigate a culture by looking at its binary opposites. These, he argued, are manifestations of the underlying rules that govern social life. To understand more about how structuralism works, Let's imagine two toy factories. These factories have several obvious differences. One factory is based in Japan and makes toy cars. The other is based in America and makes toy airplanes. The factories pay their employees different wages, and their management structures differ too. Further, the toy cars are packaged in boxes, while the toy airplanes are encased in plastic. But despite these differences, they still share many of the same practices. To Strauss's structural theory, it is these similarities which are more important as they demonstrate underlying needs. Both factories have a payment and management structure which reflects the underlying need to keep employees working and make sure that requirements are followed. Both factories package toys to look attractive reflecting the need of the factory to sell the toys. These similarities are manifestations of the logic of the human mind. This logic is consistent across businesses which need to earn a profit. Further, we can look at examples of the binary opposites evident in each factory. Toys are either suitable for sale or are defective, and employees are either timely or late. It is these rules which govern the factories and determine how they run. Strauss's book outlined what became a key theory in 20th century anthropology, and it continues to influence thinking today. Likewise, Clifford Geertz in the 1980s gave us symbolic or interpretive anthropology. Uh, and again, the purpose of this was to discover meaning. It was to analyze a culture by looking at its symbols, at looking at, at those things that contain meaning um, and everything can contain meaning and everything can be a symbol and we'll uh, do an entire lecture on, on symbols and symbolism um, um, after we talk about language and how it works a little bit but one of the things that he talks about is that looking at layers of meaning and 
he suggests that we do what we refer to as thick description. And for at this particular level, what I want you to take away from this notion is that when you're doing your field notes, and, and uh, this class probably will have an observation, uh, and you will be out in the field doing field work, and um, the aspect of thick description that I really want you to worry about at this point, although we'll get we may work on others as we get farther down the road, but initially what I want you to think about is is that essentially everything is important. That that you don't know when you're observing, and especially initially, and, and often undergrads go out and do one observation, so that means they have to kind of cover everything in one shot. You don't know what's important. Does the color of the carpet matter? It might. Does the, the, the fact that there, there's a, a cover missing from the, the plug-in on the wall, um, but the rest of the place looks really nice, um, it, is that important? Does it matter? It may. You'd never know. And so, um, and, and as I think I've said before, when you're out doing observation, using film and video and, and audio and, and things like that are good reminders, but they never, ever will replace your notes, what you write down. Uh, how you write it down doesn't matter, whether you do it while you're doing your observation. I, I tend to do my field notes after the observation because they tend to get in the way. If I'm sitting around writing down what people are saying and what they're doing and all this stuff, number one, it's obvious that I'm observing them. And number two, uh, I miss more than I actually see because I'm involved with writing the notes. Whereas if I'm just observing and then I run home after the event or after the, the encounter and, and, and try to collate what I can from there, I, I actually get more and I get a thicker description than I do if I just um, try to take the notes while things are unfolding in front of me. major problem with just looking at it as symbols is that that the deeper, uh, you, you can lose the big picture. You can get lost in the woods, right? You can get t technically lost with the tree, um, not looking at the, um, at the forest as a whole. Um, for example, in, in, uh, the example I use on this slide is that you know, economic and political conditions um, often are um, seen as being... Um, the cause of something, but really they are, they may end up being uh, the result of, of several other things. And so by not understanding the, um, by, by focusing too much on the depth, we sometimes le lose that top level of analysis, that top level of understanding. Clifford Geertz's The Interpretation of Cultures. Culture is the common interpretation of public signs and symbols. In 1973, Clifford Geertz published a collection of essays called The Interpretation of Culture to support this thesis. In it, he outlined a methodology for understanding the nature of cultures. Geertz was an early advocate of the School of Symbolic Anthropology, conducting his research in Indonesia and then Morocco. This school of thought argued that culture is not explicable through power or through systematic frameworks such as the law. Instead, culture is semiotic, meaning it is understandable in terms of symbols and people's interactions with them. In the interpretation of culture, Geertz adapted Gilbert Ryle's earlier concept of a thick description. This idea held that the understanding of certain events or symbols depends on their context. For Geertz, a thick description of an event or symbol gives far more than a factual summary. Importantly, it also takes into account the context which gives the event or symbol meaning. To understand Geertz's ideas better, let's consider one of his own examples. Picture someone winking. A thin description of this event would simply be a factual account of what occurs. It would describe the contraction of muscles around one eye, which causes it to shut. In contrast, a thick description looks beyond this, taking into account the context which gives the wink its cultural meaning. Let's look at two different contexts a wink can occur in. Meet Sarah and Toby. Sarah is being interviewed for a job by Toby. At the end, they shake hands and Toby smiles and winks at Sarah. From the context, we can assume that Toby was impressed with the interview and wanted to let Sarah know this. Consequently, Sarah feels hopeful that she will get the job. Now instead, 
Let's say Toby and Sarah are in a bar, and Sarah offers to buy Toby a drink. Toby accepts, and Sarah passes him the drink, winking as she does so. Now that the context is different, so is the meaning of the wink. It is now flirtatious, and a suggestion of interest from Sarah to Toby. Even though the gesture was the same, placed in these two different contexts, it has an entirely different meaning. Only through understanding the meanings people apply to winking can we judge the intention in each scenario. Clifford Geertz was a highly influential American cultural anthropologist, and his ideas continue to resonate in modern academic thought. Since the 1980s, anthropology has really become uh, steeped in its roots in the humanities. Uh, we have spent a lot of time examining our past. Uh, this primarily comes out of the fact that for most of the 19th century, we were the primary assistant to the colonizers in controlling the colonized. And so we, we now look at um, our, our goal, not so much as to help the colonized be colonized, but to decolonize the colonized and to um, really be a voice for the voiceless. Um, we tend to try to challenge generalization. The, the, in, like I said, in the past we looked for these grand theories, one theory that could explain how society works. And since the 1980s and, in, and definitely into the, the uh, 21st century, we acknowledge that, that, that it, it, we go even beyond Boaz's particularity, his historical particularity and, and cultural relativism to, to really uh, deep down believe the uniqueness and the, and the, the um, uh, separate identity of, of, of almost every, every cultural combination that we're in and, and, and realize that, that uh, there's value in, in all of the different cultures and societies that we're each members of. Um, and we emphasize not just the observation, which is where we start, but also a dialogue. And that dialogue isn't just in having a conversation or just doing an interview. That is that participatory observation. That, that the fact that you go into the community, you become part of the community, to whatever degree that you do become part of the community. If you're, if you're living in the community for three months to 12 months, you really are a member of that community. And just by your existence, you've changed the nature of the community. I tend to uh, not do the long stays. I do the long duration where I go into the communities uh, over, uh, repeatedly over a long period of time. That way I can sleep in my own bed at night. And, uh, but, but again, each community is specific and each one is, um, uh, is unique. And, but once you become part of it, you change it. And you have to acknowledge that you've changed it. You have to be able to differentiate where you've made those changes and, and how to analyze the society uh, around that. The whole process, the whole reason for going out into the field, the, 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 the central purpose of doing ethnography is to make meaning, is to, to, to try to suss the meaning out of the actions of our fellow human beings. And that by understanding all of the various and sundry points of view that are out there, the different, uh, different ways to view the world. Look, we all grow up in very isolated uh, 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 situations. So, uh, very few of you in this class or in any of your classes uh, are from other countries. Very few are from other states. There are few, and you're more likely to see them here at, in college or at the university than, than anywhere else. Um, but you're coming from a very narrow background. Um, uh, the, the idea is that, that, that you have to expand. And that often means you have to give up the, your attachment to your own ideas. What you believe, what you think is important, those are perfect for you. And, that, 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 and, they, and you shouldn't in any way, shape, or form um, um, necessarily give them up or, or, or diminish them in any way. But what you need to do is when you look at other cultures is make sure that you're not judging them on yours, on your culture, but on, on their own culture themselves. Um, 
even trying to categorize, even setting up the various and sundry categories, like I said, the hunters and gatherers, horticulture, agriculture, etc., etc., etc. No two societies, no two cultures are the same. And so to lump them together in these broad categories is limiting. Uh, we do that just to make it easier to have a discussion, but it doesn't necessarily make it uh, any more accurate. And so even by categorizing, we, we often will uh, limit our, our understanding. And of course, the, the biggest problem that we have with a lot of this is that um, we can end up with extremes. And extremes uh, kind of blow out the, um, the concepts uh, that, that we're trying to apply somewhat globally, somewhat objectively. Um, and so uh, we have to be very careful that we don't for example, you go in, you look at it as, as a society, and the first person that you meet is a liminal member of that society. They are from that society, but they're on, an outcast. And that very often is the case when you first start studying a society or a culture. The people who are most likely to make themselves available to you are not necessarily those who are in the mainstream of that culture. There may be the ones that are on the edges of that culture. And they've already done analysis of the culture. That's one, it may be one of the reasons that they're separate, or maybe because they are separate, they see the culture a little differently than those that are in the middle of it. And so, um, where that is a problem is if they are too far from the mainstream of the culture, then they get in the way and, they, and it makes it difficult to gather data, to uh, an analyze, and, and to um, really try to make some conclusions out of, out of our research. So um, there are issues with this, but, but um, essentially since the 1980s, most anthropologists were very theoretical in our foundation. When, when we write for other anthropologists, the first third of, of what we write in a paper isn't our findings, it isn't the, even the, 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 the raw data, it's the theory that we're using to explain what it is we're looking at. And so we will lay out that theoretical foundation for that particular paper. And, and we may look at the same society, the same culture, and use different theories at different times and in different ways to analyze it different, to analyze it differently. Um, you know, I may use theory that's related to social memory at one point, I may use habitus at another point, I may use, um, you know, structuralism or linguistic theory from in another point or symbolism. Um, you know, I can approach each of my cultures, each of my societies, each of my, my communities, um, from a dozen or more different directions, and that's the way uh, that it should be. Now, as we've already talked about the subfields, uh, the major subfields, uh, archaeology, biological anthropology, um, ethnog sociocultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology. Um, before we go on, I just want to kind of hit some of the subfields. Medical anthropology deals with anthropological studies of the world of medicine. So hospitals, doctors, patients, uh, rest homes, um, birth, death, all of those things. Political anthropology looks at, at uh, how politics works. Environmental anthropology can look at um, the impact of um, logging or mining or building uh, dams or uh, the effects of, of pollution on different populations or the effects of, of um, radiation or all, all kinds of things, Any, anything related to the environment. Economic anthropology, of course, looks at, at, uh, culture through an economic lens. Um, and then the, uh, one of the more interesting uh, subfields uh, is, is referred to in this country as applied anthropology. In Europe, and, and especially in England, it's called engaged anthropology. And there's a slight difference. Um, applied can be both applied to um, um, working in the, in the, um, the, the, the non-governmental organization or the non-business or in other words, the, 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 the uh, not-for-profit sector. You know, in other words, working with communities of homeless or uh, migrants or, or various and sundry um, subgroups that are um, in, in, some in, in some respect, they, they are, are out of the mainstream. They need to be looked at. And they need to find ways to solve problems. This could be over race, ethnicity, gender, uh, any of these things. And uh, engaged is, is dealing with that as, a, uh, as an issue and trying to find solutions 
applied has that as the stated uh, uh, goal, but also gets, and I don't want to say twisted, but it also gets applied, applied does, to things like market research and product development and um, uh, efficiency in um, uh, the business setting and things like that. There are a lot of ways that anthropology can help business. Um, a lot of anthropologists don't want to help business because, they, again, they, they feel like they're selling out to the colonizers. But, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a valid subfield or a valid application of the things that we do. And that wraps up this discussion on anthropological perspectives.